for the sake of your family, leave the lights on. These were the words the Perrin family heard from a neighbor right after moving into their 200-acre dream home. This is the real story behind The Conjuring and the family that was haunted for a decade. Let's dive into this haunting in story form. Carolyn and Roger Perrin, along with their five daughters, Andrea, who is 13, Nancy, who is 11, Christine, who is 10, Cindy, who is 8, and April, the youngest, who is 6, moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island in the winter of 1971. It was built in 1736, and this 200-acre property was everything the Perrin family wanted. It even had a stream cutting through it. One cold late afternoon in 1971, the Perrin family had just finished bringing in the last of their belongings inside the house, and it was a mess. Boxes and bags were piled up everywhere, and Carolyn had asked her husband, Roger, if he could run into town to grab some dinner for the night. Excited and happy to be moving in, Roger told her that he wouldn't be gone too long. He grabbed the keys off the counter and left. The house was dimly lit, and the sun had almost disappeared. Although Carolyn had turned up the heat, Somehow, it was still cold inside. She could hear the girls running throughout the house, making sure they claimed the right bedrooms for themselves, and Carolyn was sitting on the floor leaning against one of the cardboard boxes that were spread out throughout the entire living room. She closed her eyes. This will be good for us, she thought. When Roger walked through the front door, Carolyn, who had dozed off, woke up with a jolt. When her eyes met her husband's, she saw the concerned look on his face. What's wrong? She asked Roger, who shook his head and chuckled. Oh, it's nothing. I think I'm just being silly. I ran into the neighbor down the road and, well, we started talking, and when I told him about moving in, he said something odd. Carolyn waited. Well, he said for the sake of your family, leave the lights on. Isn't that weird? At that same moment, their second oldest daughter, Nancy, who was coming down the stairs, saw a man wearing a black hat standing in the front entrance. When she looked around to find her father and turned to look back at the man, he was gone. It's probably just my imagination, she thought. Carolyn told her husband that maybe the neighbor was just trying to spook him, poke fun. Roger, who reluctantly agreed, called down the girls to eat the takeout that he brought home. A week went by as the family settled in, and one afternoon, Cindy, the second youngest, was playing in her room after school when she heard her mother calling her name. She left her dolls on the floor and rushed down the stairs. When she came back up holding a sandwich, she saw that all of her dolls had disappeared. Cindy put the sandwich in her mouth to hold and got down to the floor and started crawling around to look for them. When she crawled towards her bed and looked underneath it, she saw all of her dolls perfectly placed in a row, leaning against the wall. She knew she didn't do this. In the room next to hers, Andrea, the oldest, was putting away clothes in the wardrobe when she heard a thunderous knock come from inside it. Thinking one of her sisters was playing a prank on her, she slowly walked towards the wardrobe. Gotcha, she said quickly moving the clothes over to the side. But the wardrobe was empty. Andrea shook her head, thinking, this was just my imagination. Can you please tell Cindy that I didn't touch any of her dolls? Said April, the youngest daughter, walking into Andrea's room. Cindy had followed April into Andrea's room, accusing her of moving them. Rolling her eyes, Andrea calmed them down. Downstairs in the kitchen, Carolyn was sweeping the floor before she started dinner. Wrapped in several layers, she felt cold, lifeless, and her body ached. She placed the broom against the dining table to move the rug from the floor to sweep under it. When she went to grab the broom without looking, she felt nothing. She turned her head to look and noticed that the broom was resting against the wall in the opposite corner of the room. Maybe I misplaced it, she thought. As each day passed, the family dealt with more and more strange occurrences. Carolyn would hear screeching noises coming from the kitchen. She'd find fresh dirt covering the floors minutes after sweeping them. One day, the house was having electricity problems, so Roger went down to the dirt floor cellar to take a look at the breaker. As he walked downstairs, he felt something graze his back, and when he turned quickly to look, nothing was there. It was just him, in the dimly lit cellar, standing in the middle of the staircase, alone. That night, the girls were in their beds, drifting off to sleep, and Carolyn and Roger were in their bedrooms. Cindy and April, both sleeping in their twin beds, woke up to the sound of their bedroom door creaking open. It was just past midnight. 
their mother always gave them a goodnight kiss, which she had already done. Cindy had her eyes closed and felt a cold kiss on her forehead. She could smell the scent of fruit and flowers. Her mother always smelled of ivory soap. When Cindy opened her eyes, expecting to see her mother hovering over her, she saw no one. This was the first strange occurrence that made Cindy feel uneasy, but this occurred every single night. Something was tucking them in. Two months after moving in, the Perrin family was convinced they bought a ghost-filled home. Things periodically went missing, they could feel more than one presence inside the home, but they weren't truly a bother. To some extent, the family was just happy and relieved that they weren't being harmed in any way. But the peace they created, despite the presence that resided in the home, would be shattered, and horror would slowly replace it. One cool spring day, several months after moving in, all five daughters were playing hide and seek on the property. Andrea closed her eyes and started counting to 20, and all of them scattered. Nancy and Christine ran into the barn that was situated right next to the house, giggling. They could still hear Andrea counting. They found a pile of hay to hide behind and trying not to giggle, crouched low to the ground. Shh, she'll hear us. At that moment, they heard a loud thud coming from the rafters above. They both looked up, but they saw nothing move. Nothing was up there. What was that? I don't know, but let me go check. Christine got up to take a closer look, and she walked towards the center of the barn, when all of a sudden, the barn doors shut by themselves. They looked at one another nervously and ran to the doors. They pushed as hard as they could, but the doors wouldn't budge. That's when Christine felt something shove her back and slam her against the door. Nancy looked at her sister, horrified, and they both began to scream. They banged on the doors, yelling, but they were trapped. Just then, a scythe that was hanging on the wall started to levitate, suspended in air. They both stared at it in fear, but also mesmerized. Just then, it flew towards them and they ducked as quickly as they could. The scythe hit the barn door before falling to the hay-covered ground. Filled with terror, they lifted their fists to bang on the doors again, but the door suddenly opened. Both Christine and Nancy fell to the ground at Andrea's feet. Andrea, who was in shock at how scared her sisters looked, asked what was wrong, and when Christine and Nancy told her, it dawned on all three of them. There were more than just friendly beings that dwelled on their property. The next night, it only got worse. The whole house was dead silent, everyone was fast asleep. Andrea woke up to the feeling of someone lifting up her blanket. She whipped her eyes open, but didn't move. Then she felt the weight of something ease into her bed right next to her, but she still didn't move. She felt paralyzed with fear. And at that moment, she heard a high-pitched whimper right next to her ear. And when she finally found the courage to turn over, she saw her sister Cindy shaking with tears running down her cheeks. I keep hearing them, Annie. I keep hearing them. Andrea quickly sat up and put her arms around Cindy, trying to console her. Hear what? What are you hearing? Cindy told her that she had been hearing multiple voices throughout the night in her bedroom. One in particular wouldn't let her sleep. It said there are seven. There are seven dead soldiers buried behind the wall in my bedroom. It kept waking me up in the middle of the night, saying the same thing over and over. Right then, Cindy began to repeat those words over and over again as if in a trance. Andrea, not knowing what to do and scared for her sister, held her in her arms until she stopped. She told Cindy that she could sleep right next to her that night, that they'd get through this. At 5.15 in the morning, Andrea and Cindy woke up to the smell of rotting flesh coming from the dark corner of the bedroom. Andrea, unsettled, got out of bed and walked over to it to investigate where the smell was coming from. Turn on the lamp, Cindy, she asked. But when Cindy reached over to the lamp and pulled the string to illuminate the room, they saw that there was nothing inside the bedroom. No dead animal, nothing strange except for that strong, foul smell that only came from that one spot in the corner. Six months after moving in, more and more strange activity started to occur on the property. The daughters quickly realized that the benevolent spirits that resided in the home were being replaced by malicious and evil beings. Cindy was even locked inside a solid oak box while playing hide and seek one day. There was no latch, there was no lock keeping her inside. 
It was as if some thing was trapping her in it, slowly waiting for her to suffocate. While the children were being haunted, shoved, pushed, tortured by whatever was inside that house, their mother was being pursued by something vile. Carolyn was lying on the couch one afternoon while the children were at school and Roger was at work. The house was dead silent. Lately, she had been feeling drained, lifeless, as if all the energy was sucked out of her body. At that moment, a sudden chill filled the entire living room, as if a veil of ice-cold air was draped over her on the couch. Then, she felt a stabbing pain in her right leg. When she opened her eyes to take a look, she saw blood dripping down her leg onto the carpet. She quickly got up and ran to the kitchen and grabbed a rag to wipe the blood from her leg. Dabbing the rag with some water, she ran back into the living room and started to scrub the carpet. At that moment, she felt like something was standing right behind her, watching her. Carolyn heard a whisper and she could feel something touch her back. When she slowly turned around to look, there was nothing behind her. And she didn't mention this to anyone. That night, Carolyn was in bed next to Roger, who had already fallen asleep. She was tossing and turning, going in and out of sleep. Little did she know that whatever was standing next to her bed would mark the start of her decade-long haunting. She heard a soft moan at first, but then it grew louder. She opened her eyes and turned to face the noise. Standing over her was a woman in a gray nightgown. Her neck was bent in an unnatural position and her eyes were pale yellow. Get out, get out. I will drive you out with death and gloom upon you, the woman growled. Carolyn immediately fell out of bed shrieking. She crawled away from the woman as fast as she could. Roger woke up immediately and ran to his wife who was on the floor, huddled in the corner, shaking. She kept pointing at her side of the bed, trying to speak, but no sound was coming out of her mouth. Roger looked at the direction of where she was pointing, but saw nothing. He consoled his wife and with some difficulty, lifted her off the floor and walked her back to the bed. There's nothing there, I promise you. It was just a nightmare, he told Carolyn. But Carolyn lay awake that night, unable to sleep. She sensed that this was just the beginning. In the following weeks, she had horrible, vivid nightmares of the house burning in flames. She felt horribly drained and weak despite any amount of sleep. And in the next few weeks, the daughters would see the woman in gray too. One late evening, Cindy was in her room playing with her dolls on the floor alone. Despite the hauntings and the horrific incidents, she was resilient. She was trying to remain in good spirits. As she was about to pick up another doll, she heard her wardrobe unlatch. Her head quickly spun in its direction and she saw the old Victorian wardrobe door creak open slowly. Cindy, thinking it was one of her sisters, got up from the floor and approached it. And at that moment, she saw a hand coming out from behind her clothes. It was pale and putrid. She backed away slowly in fear, and then she saw it. The bent and broken neck. It looked like it was festering like a wasp's nest covered in tar. The woman emerged from the wardrobe with her arms extended towards Cindy, intending to hurl herself at her. Come to me, little one, the woman said, floating towards her. But Cindy, who was filled with terror, wasn't going to stick around. She ran out of her room as fast as she could and went to go find her sisters. At that exact moment, Carolyn sensed that she was being tormented by something vile. It started slowly. One minute, she was the comforting, caring woman her children knew, and then the next, she had a distant expression on her face. Her children and Roger were afraid of what was happening to her. She was different. The family had spent quite some time living inside that house being tormented. All they wanted to do was leave, but they couldn't. They poured everything they had into this house and they didn't have enough money to just up and leave. They lived the feeling of being watched every single day. The sadness and loss that filled every crevice inside that house overtook them whenever they stepped inside it. A friend of the parent family, Barbara, heard of their troubles and went to go visit them one summer day. When she arrived, she could see how lifeless the family looked. Roger was the only one that was still skeptical, but Barbara felt like she had to do something, that she had to help them. She attended a lecture the following week in Putnam, which was about 20 miles away from Harrisville. The speakers were Ed and Lorraine Warren. 
a couple who were paranormal investigators that dealt with hauntings and possessions. Barbara felt that they were the answer the Perrin family had been looking for. After the lecture, Barbara approached the Warrens and informed them about what was going on inside the Perrin family home in Harrisville. Intrigued, they agreed to visit. The following week when Ed and Lorraine entered the house, Lorraine immediately sensed a malevolent spirit among the ten that resided in the home. They made frequent trips to the house, learning more about the presence each time. But every time the Warrens entered the house, they were drawn to the dirt floor cellar. Something evil was down there. A strong demonic presence, Lorraine said. The Warrens stayed late one night investigating the house, and as they were setting up their equipment, they noticed Carolyn acting odd. She wouldn't respond to any of their questions, nor was she coherent. A sinister expression fell across Carolyn's face, and in that moment, Lorraine knew that she and her husband had to do something. They sensed that whatever was inside the home would eventually destroy everything living in it. That night, the Warrens conducted a seance to rid Carolyn of whatever was tormenting her. This time, a medium, someone who could make contact with spirits who knew the Warrens, was present. An exorcism was just out of their realm of expertise. Roger didn't think this was necessary. He didn't believe in what the Warrens were doing. The several times the couple visited the house was while Roger was at work. Lorraine approached the daughters. You all need to stay up here. It is much too dangerous to go down there once we begin. The Warrens took Carolyn down to the cellar. Roger protested, but not knowing what was going on with his wife, he listened to the couple, begrudgingly. Both Ed and Lorraine tied Carolyn's arms to a chair with rope. Roger looked on nervously, standing behind them. Carolyn, who seemed terrified and confused, sat still, hoping this would be the end of it. When the seance started, all hell broke loose. Whatever was tormenting Carolyn had taken over her body right then and there. The daughters, who were upstairs anxiously waiting, felt the house rattle and then saw the lights flicker. You can't go down there. It's down there, Christine told Andrea, who was approaching the cellar door, intending to go downstairs. I, I, I just want to take a look. Andrea opened the heavy wooden door leading down to the cellar and descended the stairs. She crouched low and sat down on a step where she wouldn't be seen halfway down the stairs. What she witnessed almost made her faint. In the dimly lit cellar, Carolyn began to shout in an unfamiliar, guttural voice convulsing in the wooden chair. A low, demonic growl was coming out of her mouth. Andrea couldn't take her eyes off her mother. Carolyn was twisting and contorting her body as if in terrible pain, while Ed and Lorraine continued the seance. Roger was pacing back and forth, worried for his wife, but then Carolyn stopped, and the whole room was filled with silence. The Warrens and Roger stood motionless watching Carolyn, but all of a sudden, she and the chair began to levitate above the dirt floor. She was only a few inches off the ground, but Carolyn was in a daze. Her face was distorted. But at that moment, she was lifted higher by an invisible force and then flung against the cement wall still strapped to the wooden chair. Everyone heard Carolyn's head hit the ground with a crack. Andrea, who was still hiding on the stairs, covered her mouth with both hands, trying not to scream, thinking that her mother didn't survive. Roger ran over to his wife to make sure she was breathing. He checked her pulse and then slowly turned around to look at the Warrens. Get out. Get the hell out of my house. You just made it worse. The Warrens tried to protest, but Roger ushered them back upstairs and then kicked them out. Carolyn had suffered a concussion that night. Throughout their visit, Ed and Lorraine insisted that the spirit tormenting Carolyn was named Bathsheba Thayer, but they were wrong. Bathsheba was a spirit tied to the house shore, but she was a mother during her living days. She was born in 1812, had four children, and three of them unfortunately passed away at a very young age. For the remainder of her life, she mourned their death and became bitter. She passed away in 1885 from paralysis due to a stroke. During her living days, she was suspected of practicing witchcraft, but no evidence was ever found. The property once belonged to the Arnolds, who resided in the farmhouse well before Bathsheba was even born. 
eight generations have lived and died in that house. Mrs. Arnold, the woman of the house in her 90s, learned about her husband's death after he passed away of natural causes. In her sorrow and anger, she hung herself in the barn in 1797. After several hours, someone who worked on the farm found Mrs. Arnold cold and stiff and brought her body inside the farmhouse before burying her. The Perrin family believed the spirit that was tormenting Carolyn was that of Mrs. Arnold, the lady with the broken and festering neck who took her own life out of anger and sorrow. She was believed to be challenging Carolyn's authority over the house once she stepped inside of it. Several months after the seance, Carolyn still hadn't recovered from it. Although some activity died down, horrifying events still occurred. Five years after moving in, Andrea had gone off to college and the girls felt a void without her. One early fall morning, Cindy felt something jerk her from her bed. She looked around in a panic. And in that moment, the bed began to shake violently and it moved across the room by itself before coming to an abrupt halt. Cindy, clutching her blanket, began to scream as terror filled her entire body. She couldn't see anything or anyone around her. The bed jerked again, but then started to lift off the ground. She quickly jumped out of the bed and opened her bedroom door and ran down the stairs, furious and angry that no one came to help her. Carolyn was sitting at the dining table, drinking her coffee in silence. Didn't you hear that? Didn't you hear me? Hear what? What are you talking about? The only thing I've heard this morning is you screaming at me, Carolyn told her daughter. April, the youngest daughter, had befriended a spirit that lived in her closet, Oliver Richardson, a boy who lived in the house many years ago. She never mentioned him to the Warrens, scared that they would get rid of him. As the days passed, the smell of rotting flesh came and went from the corner of Andrea's bedroom. The cellar was the only place inside the house the family feared entering. They had learned to live with the spirits inside their home. They saw apparitions of a father and son on the staircase. They saw an old Victorian woman coming out of the kitchen. And when they searched the history of the house, they learned a dozen people had met a tragic death on the property. The family finally sold the house in 1980 and moved to Georgia, but whatever was haunting them had followed them there. Carolyn's words after leaving the house were, We left the farm, but it will never leave us. If you liked this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss any more stories. And I'll see you in the next one.